In this tape, I'll show you every step and every pitfall in the deceptively simple process of basic microsuture technique. We'll look in detail at picking up the needle, passing it through the tissue, pulling the thread through, and last but not least, tying the knot. As we go along, we'll take a close look at all the common causes of frustration, entanglement, and despair, and we'll see how these can be avoided. There's a lot of information on this tape. I'll suggest about halfway through that you switch off and take a break so you don't get too overloaded. Throughout this tape, the instructions are for a right-handed person. If you're left-handed, you might prefer to watch it using a mirror. Let's take a look at tools and materials. Here are the instruments you'll need. A pair of scissors with fine pointed tips for cutting the suture, a straight jeweler's forceps for your left hand with tips that meet nicely like this, and an angulated jeweler's forceps for your right hand. The angulated jeweler's is both a needle holder and a tying forceps. The material we work on is a piece of regular surgical glove rubber stretched out under very slight tension. Cut it with a knife and you've got a wound to stitch. If it pops open like this, the rubber is stretched out too much. You'll need to slack it off a little, or you'll have more tension than you can deal with. We use a clinical grade suture material that's packaged for laboratory use. It's 10 nylon on a sturdy 140 micron needle. 12 centimeters of thread is all you need. If there's more, cut it off. Now let's get down to business, picking up the needle. In the exact way that you pick it up, you set yourself up either for success or for frustration. Here are just some of the highly avoidable problems that can arise if you don't pick it up correctly. There are four things, no less, that need to be just right each time you pick up the needle. First, you need to pick it up with the right part of the needle holder. Second, you need to pick the needle up at the right point along its length. Third and fourth, the needle must sit at 90 degrees to the needle holder, both in this plane and in this plane. Let's look at each of these points and see why they are important. The first point, use this part of the needle holder. If you hold the needle too far back here, you'll destroy the curve of the needle. If you hold it too close to the tip, with just a little extra squeeze, it'll flip out of there, just like this, and never be seen again. Now the second point. Pick up the needle somewhere between here and here. That's in the middle half of the needle. If you go beyond those limits, you'll either have so little projecting that you can't do anything with it, or you'll be holding the soft channel end of the needle which bends very readily. Within these limits, the exact spot that you choose determines the upward or downward angle at which the needle will approach the tissue. Holding it back here gives the tip an upward tilt. Holding it in front here gives you a downward tilt. And holding it right here puts the needle tip parallel with the tissue, which is what you want, especially when you're starting out. In vessel surgery, you particularly don't want a downward tilt. That's a sure way to hit the back wall, and that's a disaster. Now the third and fourth points. Holding the needle squarely in both this axis and this axis is important because that's the only position in which it'll hold steady when you push it. If you have it tilted on its horizontal axis, when you push it, it'll capsize. If you have it rotated in its vertical axis, the same thing will happen. Hold it square in both planes, and it'll go where you want it to go. Now that we've seen what's important, let's see how to pick the needle up just right. There's a way that works every time. Resist the urge to go after the needle with the right-hand instrument. Instead, start with the left-hand instrument and use it to pick up, not the needle, but the thread. Pick it up here, about two centimeters from the needle. 
Now lift the thread straight up and dangle the needle so it just touches the flat underlying surface. By moving the thread around, you can make the needle point in almost any direction. In this way, get it to point roughly in the direction you want, which is toward the bottom left. Now you're ready to pick it up. Just a point of detail. As you pick it up, touch the needle first with the near jaw of the instrument. That way it'll go on pointing where you want. If you touch the needle first with the far jaw, it's easy to knock it out of position. Once you've picked the needle up, if you find it's tilted on its horizontal axis, you can correct that by giving a light touch here or here with your other pair of forceps. You can also correct malrotation in either plane by this simple maneuver. Let's see that again. Touch the underside of the needle on the underlying surface and drag the needle backwards while momentarily slackening your grip. Here are a couple of mistakes to avoid in picking up the needle. The first, as I've mentioned, is to come at the needle first with the needle holder. That usually leads to quite an unsatisfactory pickup. The second mistake is to try to correct such a malrotation by working on the needle with both pairs of forceps at once. That tends to make a bad situation worse and you can end up with your patience diminished and your needle sadly modified. Remember, pick the thread up first. One last thing to mention about picking up the needle is magnetization. If this or this keeps happening, it's because the needle or the instrument is magnetized. Demagnetize both the instrument and the needle at the same time in a coil demagnetizer, like this. Switch on, withdraw the instrument, switch off. So much for picking up the needle. Now let's look at passing it through the tissue. When you first begin, work in the direction that's easiest for you in terms of your hand position. That's with the needle pointing from top right to bottom left, like this. Make sure your hands are sitting firmly on the table, with the fingertips supported. Now put the microscope up to high magnification so you can really see what you're doing and stay at high magnification till you've finished passing the needle. Bring in the needle and pick the spot where it's to enter. The distance between the entry point and the edge of the tissue should be about equal to the thickness of the tissue. Now come under the tissue edge with the left hand forceps and raise the tissue up toward the needle, everting the tissue at the moment when you push the needle through. Do not let go of the needle at this point. Move the needle tip to an exactly matching exit point on the other side. Bring the left hand forceps in from above and press down toward the needle, again everting the tissue as the needle goes through it. Here's what you're aiming to produce, two equal sized bites with the needle crossing the wound at 90 degrees. When that's tied, the underside will look like this, nice and flat. The next action will be to pull the needle through, but before going on with that, we need to spend a few minutes looking first at some potential mistakes in passing the needle, and then at some important do's and don'ts in the matter of tissue handling. This would be a bad stitch. The bites are unequal. When that's tied, one side will overlap the other, and this tissue edge will be exposed to the bloodstream. In blood vessel surgery, that's bad news. Here's another bad stitch. The needle has crossed the wound obliquely instead of at 90 degrees. When that's tied, the long edge will pucker. See right here? And again, you'll have exposed tissue. Here's a third bad stitch. The two bites are just too big. If you do a series of those, you'll get complete overlapping of the edges. Remember I said don't let go of the needle between going in and coming out? If you do, your efforts to regain control of the needle will likely lead you into a struggle like this. In delicate vessel tissue, that kind of struggle can enlarge the needle hole, and that's bad news. I need to mention some do's and don'ts concerning the way you handle the tissue with your left hand forceps. Using the left hand forceps as a counterpressor is a nice atraumatic method, which I strongly recommend. 
Two other methods are useful in vessel surgery. Picking up the adjoining stitch and picking up the outer layer of the tissue. That's a lot easier on vessel wall than on rubber because you have the advent tissue to hold on to. One way not to pick up the tissue is to grab its full thickness like this. If you do that to real vessel wall, you'll cause serious harm. Now that we've looked at all those potential mistakes, let's get back to where we were. You've put the needle tip in and brought it out. Now you have to pull the length of the needle through. Remember, pulling is more controlled than pushing. Pull the needle through with one or two straight pulls so that its tail end rides cleanly through the needle hole. Avoid pulling it sideways. That's very traumatic. If you do that on a blood vessel, Here's what you'll get, a hugely enlarged needle hole. Once you've got the needle through, you no longer need high magnification. In fact, it would be quite a nuisance to continue with it. Turn the magnification down before continuing. Now, to pull the thread through, pass the needle to your left hand forceps and make a long, steady movement with the left hand while carefully watching for the end of the thread. When the end comes into view, Stop pulling and drop the needle. Where it lands doesn't matter, as you'll see when we've tied the knot. There are two things to avoid in pulling the thread through. The first thing to avoid is to have the thread coming through the tissue at an angle like this, rather than in a straight line like this. It's dangerous to have it running at an angle because with just a little drag on the thread, that angulation makes the thread tend to cut through the tissue. Glove rubber may withstand this, but a blood vessel won't. To avoid this problem, use your right hand forceps whenever you need to as a pulley so that the thread passes cleanly through the tissue in a straight line. The second mistake to avoid on pulling the thread through is to bring the needle and a whole lot of thread with it back into the field of view before you tie the knot. This complicates the picture enormously just when you'd prefer it to be simple. We've looked at picking up the needle, passing it through the tissue, and pulling the thread through. And we're about halfway through this tape. At this point, I'd like to review some of the classic pitfalls that I've already mentioned. First, in picking up the needle, avoid these mistakes. Picking it up with the wrong part of the needle holder, or at the wrong point on the needle, or at an unstable angle. Avoid picking up the full thickness of the tissue, Avoid taking bites that are too large or bites that are unequal and avoid passing the needle obliquely. Also, avoid letting go of the needle halfway through. In pulling the needle through, avoid a sideways pull on the needle or on the thread. Having pulled the thread through, avoid bringing the needle back into the field of view. Lastly, avoid using the wrong magnification. If you have it too high when you're picking up the needle or too low when you're going through tissue, or again too high when you're pulling the thread through, you just can't do the job. I've given you a lot to remember already. Let's stop the tape and take a break. Now let's look at how to tie a knot. Tying a knot looks so simple. Why is it that when you first try it, this happens, and this, and this. You'll be glad to know that scenes like these are not a necessary part of the human condition. There are some simple tricks that'll make knot tying easy for you. By far the biggest trick is to set yourself up for success before you pick up the thread, both with your left hand forceps as you begin and with your right hand forceps when you're halfway through. I'll explain this in full as we go along, but first let's look at the four separate acts which make up the tying of a simple half knot. It's useful to consider each of these separately. Here they are. First, you pick up the thread with your left hand forceps. Second, you make a loop of thread on the tip of the right hand forceps. Third, you pick up the end of the thread with the right hand forceps 
and forth, you pull the end of the thread through the loop. Let's look at each of these acts and see where the problems arise. Act 1, picking up the thread. Be sure at the start that you have the right amount of thread to work with, both here, that's the short end, and here, that's going to be the loop. If the short end is too short, you're likely to pull it through by mistake. If it's too long, you'll have trouble pulling it fully through the loop. Three millimeters is a good length for the short end. That's a little shorter than the tip of these angulated forceps. For the loop, you need a length of thread about three times as long as the short end. If the loop is too short, again, this happens. If it's too long, you can't work with it concisely, and you'll have to make oversized movements to get it to behave. Let's get back to the action. Here you are, all ready to pick up the thread, and now I'm going to tell you the first big trick. Watch carefully. Pick the thread up the right way round, like this, not like this. There's a spectacular difference. When you pick it up like this, the thread that's going to be the loop emerges from the side of your forceps which you can't see. That's the side which faces away from where the knot is going to be. The thread which faces that way will strongly resist your efforts to turn it into a loop. If you do make a loop with it, it'll try hard to fall off your forceps. Most frustrating. By contrast, when you pick it up like this, the thread that's going to be the loop emerges from the side of your forceps which you can see. That's the side that faces toward where the knot is going to be. When it faces that way, it'll have a strong urge to become a loop. And once you've made the loop, it'll be quite willing to stay on your forceps. Because this is such an important point, let's look at some real life situations. This is right. Look how easily that loop was made. This is right, too. The loop almost makes itself. But this is wrong. Look at this hassle. And this is wrong, too. When you pick the thread up the wrong way round, it just refuses to be made into a loop. Always arrange for the thread that's going to become the loop to emerge from the side of your forceps that you can see. That way you're working with the thread instead of fighting it all the time. Believe it or not, about half of all the problems that people experience in knot tying arise from that one simple problem in picking up the thread. As you practice, you might want to create the problem for yourself deliberately, just so that you can experience the frustration for yourself. So much for Act 1. Now for the second big trick. Before you start on Act 2, which is making the loop, you need to set yourself up so that you'll easily be able to perform Act 3, which is picking up the short end. Let's look at the potential difficulty. It's a matter of where the thread is pointing and where your forceps are pointing. The short end of the thread may be pointing north, south, east, or west, and it may be lying down flat or sticking up in the air. Your forceps also may be pointing in any direction. If the thread is sticking up in the air, there's no problem. You can get hold of it readily no matter what direction your forceps are pointing in. But if the thread is lying down, you can only pick it up if the gap between the tips of your forceps is in about the same plane as the thread. If the plane of your forceps is at right angles to the line of the thread, there's no way you can get hold of it until you turn your forceps around. Here's the struggle I get into when I fail to anticipate that problem. My thread is lying in such a direction that I won't be able to pick it up. Disregarding that, I go ahead and make a loop, and it's then that I find that I can't pick up the short end. I try the same move several times just to upset myself. Then I belatedly figure that I have to change the direction of my forceps, and in my efforts to make that gross movement, either I pull the short end through, or the loop falls off the forceps. 
Here's how to avoid these problems. First, look and see if you'll be able to pick up the short end. If not, then make the necessary adjustment so you can pick it up. Then make the loop. Then pick up the short end. That's the second big trick. It's really that simple. Now that we've previewed Act 3 so thoroughly, let's go back to Act 2 and look at making the loop. Bring the left hand forceps toward the site of the knot and at the same time bring the tip of the right hand forceps down over the loop length of thread. Curl the right hand forceps round the half formed loop and the loop is made. Just a few points here about making that loop. First, as with all instrument ties, be sure that you have the right hand forceps pointing away from the site of the knot. If you point them toward it like this, you get a loop that doesn't have the necessary twist at its base and you end up with no knot at all. Another important detail, if you come as I showed you from above the thread and make your loop this way round, you'll end up with a half knot which lies flat and that's the first step toward a good square knot. If instead you come from below and make the loop the other way round, you'll get a half knot that lies awkwardly and you're likely to end up with this instead of this. There are three mistakes in loop making which all result in the loop falling off the forceps. The first is to make the loop too tight. The second is to have it perched too close to the tip of the forceps. Here's what you want, a loose loop back here on the forceps. You can guide it there if you need to by pulling with the left hand forceps like this. The third way to lose the loop is to make it somewhere far away from where the knot is going to be and then make a journey with the loop poised on the forceps. In the course of the journey, it's easy to lose the loop. In addition to losing the loop completely, there's a strange problem that arises if the loop ever falls just halfway off the forceps like this. If you don't notice what's happened, you go ahead with Act 3, and when you get to Act 4, the loop won't come off the forceps because it's trapped. If that happens to you, you'll know what went wrong. Let's just see what happens in loop making when you have your right hand forceps pointing in a few different directions. It's the same sequence every time come down on the thread, get the loop started, curl the instrument around it. Come down on it, get the loop started, curl around. It's always the same set of actions. That's it for Act 2. As for Act 3, I've told you about that already. Provided the tip of your forceps is pointing in the right direction, there's nothing to it. Just pick up the thread and move straight on to Act 4 pulling the short end through the loop. Pull the short end across the wound in one direction and pull the loop length across it in the other direction and your half knot is complete. Three things to notice here. First, you do cross your hands over, or rather your instrument tips, as you complete the half knot. Don't let that upset you. Second, you don't attempt with the first half knot to bring the wound edges together. That's a waste of time at this stage. We'll talk about the final tightening in a moment. Third, having completed the half knot, you definitely do not let go with your left hand because from this position, you lead straight into your second half knot. Well, it seems it took a long time to talk about making one half knot, but I hope you'll find it easy. Let's look at the sequence one more time. One, two, three, four. When you've practiced it for a while, it'll go just like this. Now for the second half knot. Since you didn't let go with your left hand forceps, you can go right into the second half knot without a break. Check that you can get the short end, change position if you need to, make the loop, pick up the short end, pull it through. I know what you're thinking, just tighten the knot. I will, but there's a problem in getting from here to here. This is what happens. You pull on the two threads and before you get the wound edges together, the knot closes up and locks, and you don't want that at all. There are two ways to avoid this problem. 
The first is to make a surgeon's knot with a double loop on the first half knot. That's good, but when you're first starting out, a double loop can be quite troublesome. The second way to avoid premature locking, which doesn't call for a double loop, is this. Instead of pulling upwards on the two threads at the same time, pull sideways, first on the short end, then on the long end. Let's see that again in slow motion. Leaving the long end slack, pull sideways on the short end till the first half knot comes just tight enough. Then pull the long end over and tighten the second half knot. There's your square knot completed. Put one more half knot on top of it for security and the job is done. To get ready for your next stitch, cut the short end first, then the long end, and then pull on the long end to bring your needle back into view. Then, finally, let go the thread. I hope you've noticed that from beginning to end you don't need to let go of the thread with your left hand forceps from the moment you first pick up the thread to the moment when you finish tying the knot. Just watch that left hand forceps. It goes on holding on. It's when you've dragged the needle back into view that you finally let go your hold. That's important. If you're constantly letting go and picking up, you're not only wasting time, you're also putting numerous kinks and points of weakness in the thread. Throughout this tape, I've been working in the direction that's easiest for a right-handed person. That's with the needle passing from top right to bottom left. That's the best direction to use when you're first starting out. But in clinical surgery, you'll need to be able to suture in any direction. Once you've thoroughly mastered the basic moves, you can say goodbye to the easy position. Turn your practice piece round and learn to do good work in these different directions. Straight up and down, straight across, and backhand. This is the hardest position to master. Learn to do good backhand stitches, passing the needle not only toward yourself, but also away from yourself. Lastly, practice being ambidextrous. Convince your non-dominant hand that it can be a successful prime mover, and convince your dominant hand that it can sometimes just be the helper. We're almost at the end of the tape, so let's just review the most important points from the second half of the tape. Arrange just the right length of thread for the short end and for the loop. Always pick up the long end so that the loop length emerges from the side of your forceps that you can see. Before making the loop, set up the direction of the right hand forceps so that with the loop made, you'll have no problem picking up the short end. Finally, use the sliding maneuver to avoid premature locking. Well, that's it. We've covered basic microsuture technique. As you practice, try to remember what I've told you already on the first tape in our series, Preconditions of Microsurgical Skill. In particular, remember about avoiding fatigue and frustration, avoiding unwanted movement, and achieving good hand position. As you practice, if you find you're experiencing a particular problem, don't hesitate to come back and watch this again.